more than one million Earths can fit in our sun. New research shows that between 20% to 35% of suns eat their own planets, and a quarter of planetary systems orbiting stars like the sun had a chaotic past. The very thing that gives life can also take it away. All the planets in our solar system revolve around the sun, and they all do it in a somewhat consistent way. It's most likely that they stayed that way ever since they first came into the picture, but not all of them. This chaotic existence means that a solar system had a lot of planets in the litter until the host sun decided to melt them away. Our solar system is panned out perfectly so that no planet's gravity interferes with each other. The gravitational force on Jupiter is a lot tougher than Earth's, which means that if Earth gets close to Jupiter, we'd be another moon for Jupiter. The planet is so big that if Earth were the size of a grape, Jupiter would be the size of a basketball compared to it. Even with the best technology in the world, it's difficult to tell if stars do, in fact, eat their planets. The best way to study this is to observe binary systems. That's just a sciencey way of saying a system with two stars orbiting each other. Usually, the two stars were formed around the same time, from the same gases, and the same conditions. It means they should contain the same elements, more or less. When you open your eyes in the morning, the sunlight that's been traveling for millions of miles greets you. The closer we get to it, the hotter it is. But the rays traveling from the sun also contain certain chemicals that make it unique. The chemicals that are associated with the sun are light materials like oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and helium. You can find some other stuff in it too, but these are the main ones. By studying these elements, you can learn the history of a solar system with enough detail to determine if it was chaotic or smooth. Scientists studied 107 binary systems composed of suns like ours by analyzing the light. Since each system contains two suns, they compared and contrasted them to see the differences. They observed the stars with a thin outer layer having different elements than their companion. All suns contain light elements, but there are some that have rocky elements like iron, silicon, and titanium near the sun. These elements are associated with rough terrains that you'd find on the surface, but they're out there floating in the middle of space. The thinnest outer layer is especially rich in iron compared to the other layers. Many stars are twins at birth. Even most of the Milky Way stars have a buddy in a binary system. It means our sun is pretty unique for not having a partner. But there are some theories out there that suggest that the sun may have lost its twin in the past. It's around 184 light years away and is called HD 186302. And this might be our lucky star. A stellar nursery is where thousands of stars are born. They're made up of gas and dust that gradually collapse under their own weight. Our sun may have started in such a way 4.6 billion years ago. And when they're mature enough, they go out into the open, usually with their travel buddy. Actually, scientists claim that up to 85% of all stars could be in binary pairs or have more buddies, but over 50% are dual pairs. The only problem is that we can't really see it since it strayed from its original orbit an eternity ago. But traces of it can be found in the Oort cloud. That's the vast cluster of space consisting of comets, space rocks, and ice in the outer edges of our sun's reach. They float around quite a lot since they're far off the sun's gravity and can easily be knocked out of their orbit into open space. Flying through such a space is no different than flying through any random void of space. The reason why some of these light elements in space contain rock elements you'd find on the surface of a planet is because the sun knocked them off their orbit and devoured them as they got closer. It also happens when a star becomes too big in its place and starts eating everything around it. According to scientists, if a star eats a planet, it can make it go chaotic and spin so quickly that it eventually rips apart. But don't worry, there's a very low chance of the sun devouring the planet in the near future. Stars are formed when a huge cloud of hydrogen and helium grows until it collapses under its own weight. The pressure increases and reaches extreme heat levels we can't even measure. Eventually, the hydrogen atoms lose their electrons, causing the hydrogen to fuse together and release energy 
countering the gravity collapsing. But when the gravitational force overpowers the hydrogen fusion, the star begins to expand and becomes a red giant. And then, after around a billion years, the hydrogen in the outer core will go away, leaving plenty of helium hanging around, which will fuse with the rest of the elements around. And once all the helium disappears, gravity will shrink the red giant into a white dwarf. And when it's completely gone, the remains of the star release tons of gas and dust into space. Scientists claim that our sun has between 7 to 8 billion years left before it reaches that stage. But even if that becomes a reality, it wouldn't happen overnight. Something like this takes millions of years to take place. But what if the sun decided to devour us overnight as we speak? The planet would start feeling hot in seconds. Every slight degree change can lead to some catastrophic events. Ice caps can melt in a matter of seconds and flood the coastal lands. Even little islands in remote areas of the world will be submerged. And as it gets hotter, every snow-capped area will melt instantly and turn into desert-like climates. Some places will burn and your everyday objects will melt on the spot. The Earth's interior will also get hotter, allowing volcanic eruptions to happen across the world. Antarctica will melt from the heat, as well as the volcanoes erupting inside. And just in a matter of minutes, the whole planet will turn into fire and ash before it explodes into tiny bits floating in space, reaching areas we've never even heard of. But no worries, something like this won't really happen. In case the sun knocks us off our rotation, the results would be different. It'll also get hot because the magnetic field around us protects us from the sun's radiation. And once we get knocked out of place, the magnetic field gets tarnished and the extreme heat from the sun will boil us. The gravitational force will be unstable, so the physics of our everyday life will be chaotic. We'll have to wait 5 billion years from now when the sun turns into a red giant. It'll grow in size, eventually eating up Mercury and Venus. Chances are, Earth will also be on the menu. If Earth were to move only 900,000 miles closer to the sun, then it would be uninhabitable. It may seem like a lot, but it's only four times the distance between the moon and Earth. Detecting the chemical composition of the sun rays in solar systems that are further away could help scientists find other Earth-like planets. Since the atmosphere around these planet-eating stars changes the chemical composition, we can detect which solar systems out there have had a calm past. The main thing we have to observe is if the planets have a healthy orbit cycle. With nothing else getting in the way, we can assume that the planet could follow the same steps as Earth did for humans to be here. But this process will take ages, since there are millions of nearby stars similar to our Sun. The odds of finding a planet similar to ours are near impossible at this rate. But if so, then there might be life on those planets. There will be no way of knowing if it's intelligent life, but they might have had the same evolutionary fate as us. The Sun isn't technically the center of our solar system. It's in a space called the Berry Center. It depends on which planet you're standing in. The Berry Center is usually closest to the object with the greater mass. So, since we're on Earth, the true center of the solar system is the Sun, but not the center of it. With respect to Jupiter, the Berry Center is actually outside the Sun's surface. Jupiter is 318 times bigger than Earth, so the balance is different. The planets don't really revolve around the Sun, but around their common center of mass. Imagine balancing a pencil on the tip of your finger. You'd have to place it right in the center so that it doesn't tip on each side. Because the pencil has its mass equally distributed, it's easy to assume that everything balances its way like that, especially in outer space. But try balancing a hammer on the tip of your toe. Chances are you'll walk out of here with a broken toe. Its true berry center is close to the hammerhead rather than the actual center where you'd grip it. Earth and the Sun's berry center is like that hammer. The center of mass is more or less in the center of the object. Realistically, if the Sun were to rotate around Earth, then our little blue planet would have to be just as big as the Sun, or bigger. We can't disregard the other planets in our solar system, which means they all will have to rotate around us as well. But in the ancient days, Bright minds always thought everything revolved around the Earth. 
They called this the geocentric model. And this made sense to them because it looked like everything above us was spinning around us. The sun and the moon played vital roles in human history, and we didn't feel insignificant in the universe until way later on. In ancient Greece and the Middle Ages, the big brains used the geocentric model to study space. It wasn't until the 16th century that that model changed. Back in those times, they couldn't even imagine that everything revolved around the sun. And they didn't have the knowledge to back any of this up. The Earth can't be the center of the solar system because it's not large enough for the job. For the conditions to suit the enormous size, life would have evolved differently. We'd probably be less dependent on oxygen. Some animals, like whales and dolphins, can stay for hours without taking a single breath. They can even sleep underwater. So the humans of the sun-sized Earth would have specialized lungs and wouldn't need to constantly be taking in air. It means that the plant life would be limited, with just a few shrubs here and there. There are trillions of trees around the world, but the main contributor to producing oxygen is the algae in the ocean. With such vast real estate of oceans and seas, the algae sitting on top are pumping out the air we breathe. Oxygen wouldn't be so abundant on this planet, but our breathing mechanisms might rely on carbon dioxide, another common gas found on other planets. If the planet is hot, then water will be scarce. We would only find it on certain parts of the planet, like mountaintops. The ground would be too scorched for anything to survive in properly. We can forget about seasons as well. The sun is currently just large enough to give us what we need. But since the Earth would be so large, and the sun would be another celestial body emanating heat, we'd always feel like we're inside a microwave. The days and nights will be different, and not much precipitation will happen. With so much heat produced in the core, earthquakes and volcanoes would likely erupt all the time. The surface would practically be a scorching plain of red magma floating around. This would be the true red planet. But if we had the same landscape like on Earth, living somewhere near the mountains could save you. The mountains would still be embedded in the core, but it would be better than staying on the ground. Some of the mountain peaks could even be 100 times taller than Mount Everest. The canyons could be so deep that the Mariana Trench would feel just like a little rupture. Animals would also behave and look different. Cold-blooded animals would have to soak up as little sun as possible so they don't burn. Animals would have to rely on migration to find water in distant lands. Birds can fly for hundreds of miles for migration season, so we'd probably see certain sleek-looking birds speeding through the air. But because gravity would be so strong on the colossal-sized Earth, the flying animals would need thinner bones and a thinner core just to take flight. The real survivors would be the microorganisms. They can live in extreme temperatures and pressures and can live without oxygen for a good while. The nights would be dark since there wouldn't be any moon to reflect the sunlight. The moon would most probably be on the opposite side of where the sun is shining, so it would forever be a floating ball in the sky. The Earth's rotational speed is the fastest at the equator, so if all the planets and the sun rotated around us, then our rotation wouldn't be so significant. New weather patterns wouldn't be good for crops. Humans would have evolved differently from what we are like now. We'd probably be shorter and stockier since gravity is so strong. And because of the soaring temperatures, we'd probably live in caves all around the world. The strongest ones would have migrated to the mountains. We'd probably have the same evolutionary path as we do now, but other physical features might be different. Our pigment would likely look different to combat the heat. The desert fox has large ears for hearing out predators and for cooling itself down in the scorching desert heat. It's possible that we would also have bigger ears than what we have now for the latter reason. We'd be a lot stronger than we are, and our bones would be thick and tough to break. Gravity is one of the key components to developing our bone density and muscle mass. This means we would unlikely need tools for hunting. This would have delayed the Bronze Age and modern civilization as we know it. With little vegetation, standing upright wouldn't be so necessary to find predators around us. We wouldn't be the fastest runners either, but we'd be strong enough to fight off a pack of strange-looking wolves. And if the Earth was supersized, 
then it's possible that multiple species of humans would be roaming the land in isolated areas. Some human species would grow and evolve into the intelligent thinkers of today, but some would remain the same. And some creatures from the past would still be around, unchanged. Sharks would have been around since the dinosaurs era. They wouldn't have to change their form or adapt because of their dominance. Other animals would remain the same because of their isolation. The Galapagos Island hosts some unique animals because they've been alone for so long. Without proper predators constantly lurking around them, they don't fear humans. The new mega-sized Earth would have areas as large as Asia filled with isolated animals that could remain the exact same as when they first appeared. The human species of those regions would also remain the same, since they wouldn't have moved or experimented with anything. Their diet would remain the same, and they would get used to the climate they're in. Technology would also have flourished differently in various parts of the planet. With some areas in complete isolation, they wouldn't have access to new gadgets and inventions. It would be like living on a planet with different eras in the present day. Other areas would be so advanced, they might even be flying themselves outside the planet in search of truth and answers. Our gravity is good enough for us to live properly and develop life, but if we pumped up our size to that of Jupiter, then gravity would crush us. And being the size of the sun, Earth wouldn't even be a planet, but a brown dwarf, and would constantly be burning until it became a new sun. As of now, Earth is so small in our universe that we're practically like a grain of sand in the desert. On a cosmic level, we're an insignificant contribution to this universe. Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, flop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time, because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus. It's so close to the Sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the Sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. Now, they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. With Proxima Centauri instead, 
the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system? These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth safe and sound. It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova. It would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So, most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it. So the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the Sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh, now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that. But it has a mass comparable to the Sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light. So it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. 
Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our Sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the Sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the Sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth, and then it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny!